Thank you so much, uh, Your Eminences, uh, uh, Your Excellencies, uh, uh, dear uh, colleagues. Uh, um, the issue, as we have seen, is notoriously complex, and as a philosopher, I can only hope to give some overview of the basic ethical issues. My paper is very long, there is no way how I could uh, present it in 15 minutes, so I will telegraphically mention the main philosophical ideas behind it. Clearly, one of the predicaments of our own time that distinguishes us from earlier times is that we have the possibility and thus also the moral responsibility to try to help people in countries far away. And um, still, even if this is a new responsibility given our new possibilities, we have to maintain that there is a classical difference between acts and omissions for the simple reasons that omissions are um, easy to satisfy. If I have the omission, do not kill anybody. I have no difficulties to maintain it, but there is no way how I can satisfy the positive command, help everybody. Um, uh, this is a basic anthropological fact that we cannot get away with. So it is important to try to build a rank order among our obligations to help. And certainly, a first obligation is that to discharge debts. Before I can be generous to other persons, I have to pay back what I uh, have received myself. In a broad sense, I can also say the duties towards our, towards our own parents are duties of discharging a debt, even if there was no contract before our birth. Then I have another prominent duty to compensate for damage that I've caused. Even if children obviously are not a damage, I have also a duty to help my children, for whose existence I'm responsible, um, uh, to grow up and become responsible ad adults. Um, and, uh, uh, after having discharged these duties, there is the task to help as many people as we can. Of course, as we can is a vague term because it is not completely clear whether this is relating to the short term or the long term. If I do not discharge all superfluous money but invest it, the gains from the investment may allow me to help more people in the future. Uh, and therefore, in the long term, I may be able to achieve more good if I do less in the short term. The criteria that oblige, that, that should direct our selection of addressees of help seems to be certainly the seriousness of need. Um, I have a greater moral obligation to help a person who's danger, whose life is in danger than a person uh, who has an additional uh, uh, need. Uh, this can be based on Rawls' difference principle, even if Rawls did not extend it to the international arena. Second, there are good reasons to help people who will be soon able to help themselves, for by doing so, in the long term, I will achieve more good, because having rendered them able uh, to help themselves, I can uh, distribute my help to other people, and they themselves may become able to help others. And another criterion is that we should privilege those who are not responsible for the situation. This seems to be just in itself, and it has also the positive consequence that it deters people uh, um, from engaging in self-destructive behavior. I do not claim that I have a clear idea on how one should rank order these three principles, but this seems to be the basic three principles of ethics of helping. Now, how do, they, um, uh, do these principles apply to the situation of uh, refugees. Clearly, uh, we saw it yesterday, we have to select in our help. This means also that we have to be rational, economically rational in allocating our help. Some people have the wrong idea that economics and ethics are in contradiction to each other. I do think whenever we are facing a uh, 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 the situation of scarcity of resources, we have to apply economic thinking, and it's completely rational that we want to have the most efficient use of our resources in order to achieve uh, the greatest amount of help. Now, according to the three criteria, the refugees are certainly plausible candidates for help. Most of them are clearly not responsible for the plight. Uh, but it is not necessarily true that there are those most in need. Why? Because, for example, the people who are left behind in the country and are not able to leave it are often much worse off than those who manage to get to affluent countries. Now, we can often not help the people who are left behind in civil war-torn countries uh, because intervention is counterproductive. 
um, and not feasible, so there are no real competitors. But for example, the people who have remained in the UNHCR camps are often uh, in a much worse situation than those who had the money to pay traffickers to get to other countries. And it's not immediately clear that being generous to people to arrive at the expense of the people who are in the scandalously underfunded refugee camps is the moral thing to do. It's also not evident to me that one should abridge and shorten developmental aid. We spoke yesterday about the necessity of not only trying to overcome easily de uh, um, uh, 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 defeatable diseases, but also to grant education to everybody. And the fact that the refugee crisis has led several countries to reduce the developmental aid is not necessarily morally um, reasonable. So this is the um, uh, um, uh, application of our uh, criteria. Furthermore, one has to recognize that people will prefer to have people who can soon help themselves. And as I said already yesterday in my intervention, I think it is wise to combine migration and ref migrants and refugees policies in one law. Um, for the population in the country, it's much more easier to swallow that they open themselves up to an intelligent and productive immigration. And out of the benefits that are mutual in this case, um, then pay for generosity toward the refugees. Uh, mutual interest, institutions based on mutual interests are more lasting. I do not say that moral, morality is reduced to that, far from it, but a politician has simply to realistically assess the capacity of altruism of the population, and uh, um, we will have more sustainable results if we combine policies of selective and intelligent migration with help to the refu uh, refugees. And furthermore, there are good arguments to try to prevent people from engaging in migrations that will not end in success, because of course resources goes, go lost in this journey. Um, the country loses resources, the money is lost for travels, and as we all know, a lot of these travels are very, very risky. So it is completely reasonable that countries from the beginning explain their criteria of admission in order not to generate a behavior that is counterproductive for those who engage in it. Now, Jeffrey told us yesterday why the traditional liberal principle of open borders for everybody is not accepted by everybody. And the reason is very simple. Uh, no country can afford to open all its borders. First of all, obviously, small countries could not house millions of people. Even if they could house them geographically, the economic costs are enormous. And paradoxically, the more developed the welfare state is, the more expensive it becomes. And therefore, countries with a more developed uh, welfare states are often less generous than countries with a less developed welfare state. And third, there is the aspect of cultural capital. Uh, the reason why people are proud of belonging to a state is the fact that the state, to speak with Hegel, transforms the mere ought of natural right into a concrete social institution that gives reality to the laws. And this is something which doesn't go without saying, as the fact shows that many states do not have working um, uh, legal systems, that there are civil wars that collapse them. And the feeling of some people, while in most cases, individual cases, exaggerated and irrational, is not absurd when letting in people from very different cultural background will destroy what renders this living in this country a reasonable goal for so many people on the planet. Um, that is the reason why people are not willing to open the country um, indiscriminately. And one has to recognize there is an asymmetry between emigration and immigration. Uh, I'm a strong supporter of the right of everybody to emigrate from a country. There are some caveats. For example, I do think that an 
exit fee may be reasonable, for example, in developing countries that are building up a tertiary education um, uh, and people get the tertiary education by investments of the state and then leave the country, I think it's fair enough to say they shall pay the fees back that were invested in them um, uh, when they leave the country. But in principle, I accept a general right to immigration, but this doesn't grant a general right to immigration. It's the same thing with a job. You can quit a job, but this doesn't guarantee you that you can be um, hired by another job. So the legal question is extraordinarily complex. I deal with it in uh, my paper and the main important, the most important text of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of 48, as well as the internationally binding International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, as well as on economic, social, and cultural rights. And then, of course, the famous Geneva Convention relating to the status of refugees of 51 and the uh, protocol relating to the status of refugees of 67, which overcame the limits uh, to the European situation that were typical of a 51 um, a Geneva Convention. A lot has been achieved in this document, but of course there are a lot of limits and we are still in the dire need to try to develop these legal arrangements further. What are the main problems? First of all is the definition of what a refugee is. The refugees are people unable or unwilling to return, quoted, quote, owing to well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group, or political opinion. This definition doesn't cover, for example, victims of civil war as long as they are victims of an indiscriminate violence, as long as it is not directed toward them as members of a religious or political group. Now, of course, this doesn't make sense from a moral point of view. What is the difference if you're killed by indiscriminate bombing or if you're killed because you belong to a religious group? That's the reason why, for example, we have in the European Directive 2004-83 EC, the so-called subsidiary protection for people who face um, a serious individual threat to their life and person by indiscriminate violence added. And it would be certainly good if such an addition would be found on an international law level. Uh, the laws that are given, the, the rights that are given to refugees depend, uh, are, are, are to be ordered in three groups. The one is when they are physically present. The second group is when they are lawfully present. So also the persons who illegally enter a country have certain rights, but those who are lawfully present have more rights, and of course those who are lawfully staying have even more rights. What is extremely important is that international law does not oblige any country to accept refugees. When they enter, they have rights. And the solution that states usually find is they prevent them from, from entering. Um, and uh, the, the, uh, the way how they do it is partly bizarre, completely absurd. Australia declares parts of its territory excised. So they are not part of a territory um, according to international law so that they uh, can send the people back. America has declared that uh, uh, the prohibition on refoulement uh, does not apply um, uh, on uh, international waters. There's nothing in the convention that limits it to land, uh, in, uh, in, to sea, but that's the way how we do. I compare it in my paper sarcastically with a famous film by uh, Buster Keaton, Our Hospitality, um, uh, where uh, Buster Keaton ends up, uh, comes to a city where he is hosted by a family and then they find out that the family is in a vendetta with his family and has the duty to kill him. But of course it's southern hospitality. So as long as he's in the house, he's treated with the most lavish generosity, but he knows in the moment he leaves it, he'll be shot. Um, uh, um, uh, uh, and in many aspects, that's the situation that we are with, with regard uh, to this situation. What are the main problems that we'll have to try to change? And it's not easy because states don't seem to be interested in working on this issue in the moment. We have the first country of arrival in the safe third countries rule. Now, the rules are in principle not absurd because no Nobody can wish asylum shopping. Otherwise, if every person can choose where to go, he will go to the richest and affluent countries, and Scandinavia will soon be very, very populated. So there can be no asylum shopping. It would be far too expensive if every country had to uh, look at every applicant several times. And so, but still, the burden 
is enormous on the poorest countries because the closest neighbor of people fleeing from poor country are the poorest countries. And in fact, of the 10 countries that in uh, 2015 accepted most refugees, only one is an OECD country. The same in, within the European Union, the Dublin Free Regulation, of course, was absolutely unjust to the southern countries of the European Union. All the burden was put on Greece, Italy, um, uh, um, uh, uh, to a large amount on Greece and Italy. All these are, can only be overcome, and here I come to an end, by a legal system that tries to find a system of distribution. We have not yet been able to do it even within the European Union, and therefore it's not likely that it will happen on the national uh, level soon, based on size of the country, density of the population, GDP, and partly, I think, also um, uh, uh, in the uh, um, uh, integrability. Uh, and here, since this rule of integrability disadvantages the neighbors of the countries most suffering, mechanisms of compensation by the rich countries to those countries who accept more refugees seem to be a very important aspect to do. And I end by saying, of course, as I said at the beginning, there are specific duties of responsibility to when, uh, 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 when you have caused the damage. So former colonial powers, countries that by intervening in an unjust war like the USA and Iraq in 2003 have wreaked havoc on a country, have a positive duty to accept refugees that goes beyond the generic duty and climate refugees should be um, uh, um, uh, of course also um, accepted by the people who are responsible for global warming, even if the uh, uh, Warsaw International Mechanism for Loss and Damage does not recognize any compensatory duties. That's the hope, my hope for the future. Thank you very much. And <laughs>